I'm going to point out that that was under time. That was brilliant. Well done. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to your moderator, Lance Wiggs, who's going to run the session and introduce the panellists uh, and enjoy from here. Thank you, and while the panellists are coming up to the stage, um, let me uh, just, first of all, uh, this is the panel about business opportunities and issues, uh, and as uh, it is about business, let's first of all thank our sponsors. Uh, and most of all, um, let's just focus on the top three, Microsoft, TradeMe, and Google. Um, it is an absolute pleasure uh, to be at a conference where we don't talk about sponsors at every session. Um, it's also a pleasure to have these great companies as sponsors um, here. So thank you to you all for your support. Um, we have a fantastic set of people here for this panel. Uh, we have one politician who uh, has demonstrated that he can actually deliver a speech under time and on budget. Uh, fantastic. Um, but in, in light of uh, some of our previous panels, we are going to have a pretty strict uh, uh, approach today. We have a uh, timer down here with Siggy, who's going to be holding up a, a one-minute timer. Uh, and we're looking for some very crisp answers to questions and, and a pretty fast-moving conversation because there are seven people on the panel. Um, so. Without further ado, let's start with uh, Michael O'Donnell here uh, to my right. Michael is a whiskey drinking, motorcycle riding, hunting alpaca, owning a car racing, jet boating, bon vivant who built Trayman Motors, property and jobs. Uh, he is, uh, uh, I'm kind of afraid of his daughters actually who, who take after him except for the whiskey. Uh, they, uh, so far. He's the director of Serato Audio Research and he's on the Government five. Service Transformation Board. And he, uh, he writes embarrassingly well for a, a bunch of Fairfax uh, newspapers. Maud, you run the operations for Trade Me. Uh, it's had a huge positive impact on New Zealand, but how are you going to... Uh, what are the big issues that you see for Trade Me and, and for New Zealand economy in general going forward? Um, look, I guess one of the things in this room is that these people are kind of the masters of the digital universe. Uh, they're people that are probably going to do well in the new reality. I've been thinking more over the last few days about the small people and the SMEs um, and how they will take advantage of it. I think um, fantastic in the studies, both NZ, IER and the Infometric ones, they're all pointing in the same direction. If you look at the Bell Labs study, it predicted 32.4 billion flowing out of ultra-fast broadband. Boston Consulting Group um, found, found similar things, so that's all good, but I worry about the small people and how they will make the transition. Um, the opportunities that I think the web delivers business is around scalability, going from uh, being able to scale things with close to zero cost, um, reach and distribution, going from a local to a global marketplace, partnership ability, the ability to partner up with people you've never met to, uh, to do business, um, and automation of manual processes. And if you probably want an example of how that has changed in the game for small players, and let's pick opticians in New Zealand, for instance. I was on Trade Me a couple of months ago on the message boards. I read about this website called zenai.com, based in Florida. Um, I went there, I ordered these bifocal glasses, ordered three pairs. Um, so I heard about it via social media, I guess. I ordered them in Florida. They came out of China. I got three pairs of bifocals for $100 delivered a week later. Now, if you're an optician in New Zealand, how are you going to adapt to that? I'd say it's a pretty big adaptation, and I'm just picking that out of, out of thin air. But I guess I'm pretty concerned about the transition and how that will go. Um, so if you turn that on its head and you look at businesses, say, that um, rely on opaqueness, opaqueness of pricing particularly, um, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, those that uh, stock large physical inventories, they're going to be really challenged. Secret crack service, there's no secrets on the internet, as Judge Harvey told us, especially with social media. And global pricing, what Adidas showed us in the Rugby World Cup is there is only one price, so artificial local prices don't exist. Thanks, Mod. Right, let's uh, move on to Stephen Knightley, who is the uh, chair of the uh, New Zealand Game Developers Association. Uh, he's uh, developing games in his own company for, uh, for government, actually, amongst other things. And... Uh, he is an ex-marketer and PR guy um, and account manager in both private and academic settings. For you, what's the biggest economic imp opportunity that the internet's uh, d giving for us? So we've heard a lot already this morning just about globalisation and digital weightless exports, and, and that's all great, and that's you know, exactly what 
the games industry is doing fantastically, you know, growing 100 jobs a year in the last three years, growing 40%. So that's what we already do. But I actually think when we say the term digital weightless exports, we're also missing something as well. When you talk about weightless, the comparisons get made with, oh, well, it's just like the refrigeration of the 21st century and it's just an infrastructure issue and we've now got a market that's bigger than 4 million. Yes, that's part of it, and yes, it's a huge opportunity. But the other part of it is disruptive weightless um, goods. So the ability to not just sell things to more people, but to actually sell them in radically different ways, and that's where we'll get the disruption. And linking back to what Mod just said, that's the opportunity for the SMEs. You know, and that's what the, the, the optician you know, online company you know, has done. So you know, I suppose learning, so um, David from um, Infometrics you know, talked about one of the opportunities in the internet is, is enhancing consumer choice. So what that actually looks like is you know, new business models like freemium, giving it away for free and earning your money through microtransactions, or crowdfunding or crowdsourcing, you know, and, um, and pay what you want models. So those, those sound like radical new ideas when I talk to a bunch of people, but they're things that my industry, the games industry, they're now standard operating practices and have been for one or two years. You know, there are local Kiwi companies that have raised half a million bucks for a computer game through um, crowdfunding for a game that isn't even released yet. You know, there are people who have done pay what you want computer games and paid off their mortgages. And so where they really work is for those small SMEs who are targeting a global audience. And some people go, okay, it's still early days for these things. And when I talk about, say, micro, I'll give you an example of that, when I talk about freemium games and microtransactions, it may only be that 3 or 5% of my players of a game will actually pay money for my game. But if I'm targeting a global niche audience which has 10 million people in it, that's enough to make quite a sustainable business out of New Zealand. Thank you. And uh, right on the two-minute limit there, um, Siggy's set down here, it's quite <laughs> handy. Uh, now we turn to Fran Sutherland, uh, who I just uh, Googled, Fran, and I, I discovered you're a former NBR editor. Uh, well done for that. Uh, columnist at the New Zealand Herald, I guess, uh, amongst other places. Owner, it seems, of a company called New Zealand Inc. Limited, NZ Inc. Limited, so I guess you own us all. <laughs> and, um, Not yet. <laughs> and on the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council. The last three articles I googled you, the last three articles that I saw, uh, the titles were Timing is Everything on Iwi Claims, so some uh, uh, Iwi credentials there. PM's Visit, uh, visit capitalises on Aussie Jealousy and uh, Dotcom Fast Calls for New Police Inquiry. So a good, a good gamut of, uh, of, of topics there. So you're in an industry which is, uh, which is maybe not as advanced as the gaming industry uh, in terms of grasping these new economic models. So what do you see as the big opportunities going forward? Uh, it, well, yes, um, potentially we're all, uh, as a journalist um, in primary occupation, um, you know, obviously, um, uh, can be seen as a victim of disruptive technology in the sense that our, our, what we produce is quite easily um, pirated, used by other people, uh, and distributed through this wondrous mechanism called the internet. Um, it's the big dichotomy that everyone faces, and particularly also in mainstream media, um, which still produces uh, much of the um, hard graft which other people use uh, within their own websites. And so, so we're all looking at that. Um, how do you put walls up when they've already, when they've never been up in the first place? And that's one of the big things that um, media probably are going to have to grapple with um, for paywalls, uh, for content, if they are to survive and um, play their role as well. So, um, but at the same time, uh, not lose position. So it's 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 quite it's a big issue, but. As a journalist also, and there are a number in this room like Alistair, obviously, and the Scoop Cartel, um, the internet has provided you know, the means for people to start um, their own media without being captive to the legacy costs of old media, um, without having to buy a printing press. And I know when, when I was a young student radical, which many years ago, uh, we did buy a printing press and um, to set up a... Um, Counterculture magazine, and this is in the uh, early 1970s. Uh, got the got the printing press home, and then found you needed something called single phase power, which cost x times more than the old government pr government pr printing press. So um, the the fact that you can now go set up a website with relatively um, easy access and do it yourself if you've got some nous, uh, the the ability to have that means of distribution is um, is good. It opens competition. So in that sense. Um, 
fabulous stuff. But wearing my other hat, thinking about it from a PEC perspective, um, one thing that does concern me with the trade agreements, which obviously have been part of the conversation over the last uh, couple of days, is that the work academically hasn't been done internationally uh, to support um, what will happen with IP platforms. And so essentially what you're getting is the most vigorous and litigious IP platform, which is um, obviously the United States, being rolled out to become the um, uh, basic platform for the integration of economies within the Pacific region. And we haven't done the work here um, around our trade agreements on this. I think there is a, a big um, issue with our trade agreements in that they have so much predicated towards old economy, which is still the basis of our economy with um, uh, agriculture, right. but doesn't actually you know, uh, provide enough space for the uh, industries who want to use the internet. Thank you. Um, now let's uh, switch to uh, William Rolleston. Uh, Rolleston. Um, who just uh, just t told me it was Rolston, and I forgot immediately. Uh, yeah. William's a, is a very interesting uh, background, a medical doctor, uh, a, f a founder of South Pacific Sera, which uh, does uh, animal blood products for the biotech sector and, uh, and contract manufacturers things as well. Um, he's a farmer and the vice president of Fed Farmers. Uh, he is the, and this is the really important thing so everyone listen, he is the chairman of the MSI Innovation Board. Now, the MSI Innovation Board are the ones that decide on funding for MSI grants. So um, they, they take the recommendations of the CEO and, and say yes or no. So be very nice to William and your questions later on. <laughs> um, and uh, let's, let's change tax a little. Uh, are cows important for high technology in New Zealand? Are cows? Cows. Well, they help, pay, they help pay for the high technology. Um, look, what, what, I, what I'd like to um, do is just give you a little bit of a practical um, uh, view. And uh, we started South Pacific Sierra in, in 1988 um, on our family farm. And when we did that, uh, the first thing we had to do was export. And we were doing that um, on a party line. How many people know what a party line is? Okay. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what a party line is, it's um, it's a telephone where you share, which you share with a number of other residences. And um, when your telephone call comes through, you know it's long, long, short ring, and your next door neighbours is you know long, 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 and uh, you can't use it at the same time. But uh, the the company we set up is essentially a uh, information uh, company as well as producing products. So 80% of of our value is in information. So just quickly, um, you know, we're a farming company and there are a whole lot of things that the internet's really important for for us. Um, firstly, uh, we need to manage our property and in modern times now farmers need information and they gather information. But what's going to happen in, in the internet using the internet is actually that that information is going to be collated across New Zealand. So your rainfall, your, what your animals are doing, etc., will all be collated. So you get real time what's going on in New Zealand. That's going to be a very powerful tool, particularly in managing environmental constraints. Um, the, the second thing is that uh, it actually gets you a lot closer to market. And uh, for us, that's been really important. I mean, you see what Icebreaker have done. But, but for us, we actually deal with pharmaceutical companies. We've been able to vertically integrate um, our business right into the, um, into the customer. And, uh, and that goes to the extent of, of actually when we're doing cell culture, looking down the microscope, in real time, people in the Netherlands, our customers, can actually see those cell cultures and give us advice about what we're doing. So um, uh, that cuts out a whole lot of, of, of middle people. And if you look at the wool industry, if I can just jump around a little bit, uh, getting to the exporter, the wool goes through about five hands. With the internet, it doesn't have to. It can go straight to the carpet manufacturer. Um, so I think we're going to see a, a much better rationalisation and hopefully more value coming back to the farm. Thank you. Um, and now let's uh, turn to, to Rod McFarlane, uh, who is a lawyer. Uh, he's an IP lawyer, um, commercialization manager in the past, um, but he's now an entrepreneur. He's a director of MEA Mobile. Were you a founder as well? That's yep. right. Yeah. Founder. MEA has about 50 uh, apps out there at the moment, including um, the pretty awesome iSuper8, uh, which is, uh, I would categorize, and I hope, ho hope you, it's not wrong, as the Instagram for movies, um, or you'd, you'd like it to be. Uh, so, um, really the same question to you, what, what are the economic opportunities, but, but really focus on your own company and, and uh, how you see uh, you've taken advantage of the internet. 
Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible the opportunity that's in, in front of us now, especially with mobile. Um, and mobile represents 2% of global GDP, um, and Morgan Stanley predicting it to either be now or very shortly 10 times the size of, de of what desktop computing was. Um, so this this is a this is a huge market, and it's and it's uh, it's only getting bigger. Um, and uh, I think in New Zealand we we haven't quite reached the mindset that about that opportunity. You know, there there is no tyranny of distance anymore for a business like us. In fact, the time zone works to our to our advantage. Um, we have an office in the U.S. Um, we, we work overnight and we deliver work to our, to, or, or their, over, their, their night time, and we deliver work to them. They, they get up in the morning and they deliver it to their, the, the clients, and it, and it works great. So that's actually what used to be a disadvantage is now, is now to, to our advantage. Um, but I think, I think in the New Zealand context, um, there's still a lot of change to be made. Um, for instance, as a, I mean, we're, we're probably one of New Zealand's larger uh, mobile app development companies. We have trouble recruiting, and um, uh, one of the reasons for that is it doesn't seem that any of the universities are actually teaching the mobile languages that we need to, um, that we need the skills for. Um, and uh, so there's there's some some real real challenges there, um, and uh, you've got. Uh, even in New Zealand, half of New Zealanders owning a smartphone, uh, and 50% of them, or nearly 50% of them, using it to access the internet every day, um, and yet brand managers are still not seeing um, the, the real opportunity around mobile, um, and despite the fact that there's all those things in, in front of them. So, so there's a there's a lot to overcome, I think, in terms of uh, the the Kiwi uh, the, the Kiwi approach to to how we deal with this incredible opportunity that's in front of us. Thank you, and uh, a nasty time as well. Um, uh, Russell Norman, we've already heard uh, from, uh, and, and in very short time, so you get another go. R Russell, um, is, why is prosperity important? This is the whole aim of this internet, helping prosperity. Why is, but why is it important in the first place? Um, well, it's, a, it's it, an easy question. It, it, yeah. I guess it define, depends how you define it. I mean, if it's just um, you know GDP, uh, but obviously prosperity is about a lot more than that. Um, it's about quality of life. Uh, I mean, I, I think for 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 me, one of the key advantages of of hopefully where we're going to go is to prevent the drift. Um, I, I actually I've, I've become increasingly concerned not just by the drift of people. Um, out of New Zealand, but particularly the drift of businesses um, in economic organisations. Uh, when you look at what's been happening, uh, when you look at the top 200 companies in New Zealand and you look at the, uh, whether they're either um, becoming part of a large multinational conglomerate or whether they um, uh, have moved closer to their markets um, and out of New Zealand, my hope is that um, the kind of the development of the internet-based economy is part of the solution to slow or even reverse that drift. Um, Paul Callaghan used to talk about New Zealand needs to be a place where talent wants to live. If we can make New Zealand a place which is, because it's beautiful, has fantastic quality of life, a place where people want to live, but they can still access the rest of the world, um, and still do business with the rest of the world, then I think not only can we stop the drift, but we could even reverse the drift because New Zealand can be seen as a great place to live and do business from. And I think that if we don't do that, then we do run into the, well, actually, we've already run into the problem of the hollowing out of our economy. Um, and that will be a long-term problem for prosperity. Uh, so for me, that's one of the um, key kind of policy challenges is how do, we, how do we most take advantage of that so to slow down that drift. That means dealing with some of the um, issues that sit behind that, like education, obviously, um, but also infrastructure and getting those issues right. Excellent. Um, and finally, Anthony Royale. Um, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to struggle with some of these pronunciations, Anthony. I do apologise to everyone here. Um, but uh, he's the chair of uh, Napu Waia, uh, uh, a director of two degrees, uh, and the, uh, the Hautaki uh, Trust. Uh, he's an le electrical engineer uh, by trade originally, uh, which I didn't know. Uh, chair of uh, Te Whanua Hanui Trust, uh, which means he's a farmer. And uh, he's, uh, I found out yesterday, part of an amazing family of six or seven? Six boys. Six boys. Um, 
with, with quite diverse uh, interests, uh, including uh, one uh, angel investor who stood up yesterday in, uh, in our business session, um, and, and a bunch of others uh, who, who I'd love to meet as well. So, um, Anthony, the, the question for you is the same one as the one for, for Russell. Why is prosperity important? Um, prosperity. Uh, well, I think the, the key thing for prosperity for us is that we need to be able to pay our way in the world. And um, if you think about the future and that we need to, we want to live a lifestyle here in New Zealand. We, we, we come to New Zealand because, um, and we live here for many years because this is the place that we want to be. And we're prepared to, I think, to take some of the sacrifices to live here. But on the other hand, there are some things, fundamental things that we want. We want good education, we want good health, and we want uh, a number of these things that uh, we expect the government to provide for us, but we have to pay for it. Um, we have this great opportunity in front of us of using the internet uh, to allow us to generate new businesses to increase our wealth and, and to increase our productivity. And I think sometimes we actually focus on the wrong things. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a sec, but one of the, one of the, I just want to pick up a couple of points that the panellists have said. I want to pick up on the one that uh, Michael talked about. He's worried about the small people. Um, I'm, I'm hoping not to discriminate either against small ones or tall ones, um, but I'm, I'm really worried about the youth. And if you look at the unemployment stats at the moment, and these are terrible stats, but uh, unemployed Māori males, 17.6%. Uh, that's, these are young Māori males who are unemployed today. Females, 27.5%, not in training or education. Um, these numbers are actually double the, the, uh, the, the total population of New Zealand. And it, overall, we're about 6%, but what we've got is this bubble in our youth market, in our youth who are not employed or, or doing training. Here we have the internet, and here we have the opportunity, the kind of things that we expect our youth to get involved in, and what are they doing? They're not doing the things that we expect them to do. So it's an uh, intense frustration of mine is that we don't have a sense of urgency around training our young people to get ready for this. And it's all very well for us to be here and talk about the kind of things we talk about, but we need to have more youth here. We need to have them trained. We need to get them into a position where we, we're providing these opportunities. So there are great opportunities that we've all been working for and producing infrastructure uh, and producing great companies that are doing great things, but we are leaving behind uh, a great chunk of people who we expect to pick this up. And I think one of the key things is that we just need to focus some unbelievable, uh, urgent attention to education. Kia ora. So um, thank you for the panel for those, uh, those, those first words. What I'd like to do is focus uh, in, the, in, in the next little period on three issues that have come out from both from the panel but also on Twitter, um, and they are cows, uh, <laughs> drift, and, uh, and you know, the, the real divide uh, between uh, the 1%, the, uh, the, the 10%, and the 1% and 10%. Uh, so let's start with the, the most important one, which is, which is the divide um, between... Um, and, and how do we not just get the whole economy more prosperous, but how do we make sure that we bring everybody up uh, from the bottom? And uh, I'll throw that open to the panel, who, whoever wants to jump in on that. We heard about training and education. What else can we do? I will start just pulling people. So, uh, yeah. Infrastructure, commercialisation, training, sales ability. My business partner is American. This only works in an American accent. It's less less talk, more rock. Oh, less less rock, less talk, more rock. But try doing it in a Kiwi accent; it doesn't work. <laughs> it's still more rock. So, what does that mean? Start more businesses? Yeah, I mean, uh, get out there and do it. The, one, one of the amazing things about the the mobile market, uh, in particular, is um, uh, you used to you used to spend a long time in product development. Um, and uh, and get something out into market which was um, finessed and, and perfect. Um, the interesting thing about this market um, is that you can get something out um, that's good uh, very quickly. And um, and uh, so you can find out whether your product has uh, any commercial um, interest 
in, in almost no time. Um, and, and that's very different to any market that we've ever had before. So, so our strategy is put a lot of things into the market quickly. We've released, like you said, 50 apps over the, over the last year. Um, and then we continue to support um, those ones where there's, there's a real interest. And um, so in terms of creating economic prosperity, well, we need to adapt to these new markets um, that, that, uh, that uh, are, are completely different to, to the markets that existed before and, and, and use them to our advantage. So, so that's, and, and it's, it's great, we've got a, a free trade area in New Zealand of you know, well over two billion people, um, and you know, congratulations to successive governments for doing that. Um, but what would you, you know, what would you do if you're not a mobile app developer? If you haven't had a, a university education and you're you're unemployed and you're and you're 20 years old and there's, it, you know, it's a, what do you do? Well, ha have a look at some of the um, some of the great products that have been invented. Many of these products have been invented in garages. Yeah, sure, you've got the the guys who have actually been at university and, and left university to go and create a product in garage. You don't need a university education to be a programmer. And to be a programmer, if you start young, you get them in schools, they can learn to be the mobile programmers of the future. Uh, the challenge I have is some of these companies who are using mobile programmers is about what are you doing about getting new programs? You're, you've alluded to a problem that you're having trouble getting, uh, getting programs. In fact, I've got some stats here. So we, if we looked, um, so I, I looked at this on Seek uh, yesterday. Um, sorry to trade me, um, but I, <laughs> uh, on Seek Web there are 2,209 IT jobs, full-time, these are full-time IT jobs on Seek at the moment. Uh, I found about 1,250 on trade me. Um, but if you said there's thousands of jobs that are, that are there today, and what we're doing is we need to grow the number of businesses we have, how are we going to fill those jobs? And what are the roles that companies who are, who are looking to employ these people, where are they going to get them from? And what they should be doing about getting them. Now, you don't need a university degree um, to be able to, pro I'm just assuming, you might want to comment on that. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I, think you, I, think that's a, I think that's a great point. You, um, I, you learn a lot at university, don't get me long, wrong, I did three degrees. That, that was probably a few too many. Um, a few. Our tax dollars at work. Um, but um, the reality is that, um, uh, like I said, uh, not many of the uh, tertiary institutes are teaching mobile languages. I don't think mm. anyone, any, I think there's a, maybe only Media Design School is teaching yeah. um, uh, the, the Apple programming languages. Yep. And I think on, only Uti Unitech is teaching um, the particular style of, of Java, which is for and the Android phones. Um, and so what that means is most of our developers are self-taught or taught on the job. So like you said, you do, you do not need a university degree to do this. Um, the, the economic advantages of, uh, you know, all the tyranny of distance is gone and, and the, there's a huge mobile market there in front of, in front of, uh, in front of, in front of uh, young, young people. I think uh, we need to encourage them to get into that market and, and, and make the most of, of, of it. Okay, William? I, th I think there's an, another threat uh, that we need to look at and, and if you look in agriculture, uh, more and more people who work in agriculture need to have some sort of um, ability to use electronic devices, use the internet, um, understand IT, and, and that actually is almost exacerbating that, that divide. There are going to be people who um, are right at the bottom end who, who don't have those abilities going to be left off, and I think that's something, that's a challenge we really need to try and face. Oh, well, now let me interject on cows here. The, there's an entire technology ecosystem in New Zealand which surrounds the cow and those electronic systems that are being delivered to the farm, many of them de are developed and exported by New Zealand companies. As well as the, outside, the other side of that, what happens after the farm, uh, there's a, a lot of companies which, uh, which, do, which rely on the, the outputs, the milk and, and so on, and, and technology uh, to produce uh, even better and, and higher quality quantities of those. So it's the, the, part of their job is to make it increasingly easy for people in, ag in agriculture to use their products. Um, Anthony, I think you may have phrased the question a little bit incorrectly or misleadingly well in terms of real uptake. It's not about people necessarily being able to program, but people being able to use the net. And if you can program, fantastic. But if you're a 20 year old Maori in Timaru or somewhere and you know how to use WordPress or Tumblr, 
and you've got an entrepreneurial streak and you're a great salesperson, then crikey, you can actually get into it with no startup costs. Mm -hmm. David Farrar down the bat still runs this whole business on WordPress, and I think there's a lack of understanding yeah. of how low the barriers are. Mm -hmm. And by all means, fill your boots if you're going to be a programmer, but you don't need to be a programmer to have a great business online. No, I absolutely agree with you. Sorry, just using programming as an example. Mm -hmm. But um, people like uh, Portal, who have started up their own WordPress, tongueofdefender.com, uh, those kind of guys can be out there actually doing this stuff. What they don't realise, exactly what you said, is that there is a low barrier, but there is still a barrier. It might be low, but it's perceived to be high. What we need to do is figure out how we can make those barriers lower. Yeah, I think, I think one of the issues is um, how you divide it is... Um, a point made here about um, technology and the internet as being basically a tool for life and um, it could be as basic as knowing how to go online and find a job and it might not be a job and anything to do with technology but if you're unemployed you've got the internet you can uh, go on and search jobs beyond what might be in your local paper or word of mouth and it's as basic as that and it, I think it needs to be really um, upweighted in school so that everybody who leaves school is completely technology and internet capable and, and just everything from electricity electronic commerce to whatever. Um, the other thing, when you look at what's happening in ICT, and I had a conversation recently with Candace Kinzer um, from the ICT group, and um, one of the things that is happening um, from what she's relating to me, that the significant investment has been um, mooted for New Zealand, but the people aren't there, enough skilled people in, in the zone. And I guess since the um, I, IT wreck, um, it was seen as a no-go place. And I, I think we lost a lot of people at that time who should have been coming through. And there seems to, there needs to be some sort of way of um, making sure that um, these people are coming through the system, and I don't see any coordinated way of doing that. And I take the point about um, not needing a university degree. I mean, Bill Gates never finished either. So, I mean, a lot of people just have the smarts and creativity and want to get in there and do it, so there, there is opportunity. Let's not forget that Bill Gates uh, had a perfect score on his SAT test, an incredibly smart guy. Yeah, but he didn't complete the degree. That's, is that you know, unusual people? Yeah, 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 but there are a lot of them around. Um, yeah. There's a trend of them. I, I think what we've also mm. lost is, um, you know, back when I went to school, they had woodwork and they had metalwork and they had sewing and cooking, and which called, got called home economics. But they weren't just talking, they weren't just training trades. What they were doing is creating a space for people to experiment. Yeah. And we don't have that anymore. We, I think we need to think about creating these spaces where kids can actually experiment and, and, and it's not just about the, the, um, the electronics, but let them get in with welders and CNC cutters and 3D printers and all those kind of things. So, so let, let me hit the pause button. Um, and invite comments from the audience um, on this topic. If someone's actually had experience inside schools in particular or working with disadvantaged uh, children, um, come up and, uh, and grab a mic and uh, let's hear from you in uh, 30 to 60 seconds. If you want to talk, just, just step up and queue up by a mic. I just wanted to reiterate that, and I think it's, I did design technology at school. I was in one of the high streams. I was the only um, kid who did it in, in, in that class. It was a bit tough for me, but I think also one of the ways I saw is in that class, it was, there was a lot more emphasis on like writing reports and doing stuff, and I think there needs to be more of that emphasis on the hands-on and those um, woodwork, metalwork classes as well, to give people who have different learning styles more of an opportunity. Yep. Uh, kia ora. I'm a intermediate school teacher. Um, I think one of the problems is my students actually do blog. They're selling artwork online and things like that. But one of the things that I think is being held back is the fact that our assessment system is still based around this idea of pencil and paper. Mm. Our students are sitting exams that stuff. don't test any of these soft skills that we've just talked about in this panel. And I think we need to go back and think about what is it we want from our education system and then design our assessments around that rather than the other way around. Thank you. Um, one of my biggest problems with the sort of talk of employers saying that people need to be educated better and in specific skills and things is that a lot of our education can very well set up people to be a very good amateur or hobbyist level at something, like having wood workshops in schools, learning programming, stuff like that. 
but there's very little in the way of going from that level as a student to being a professional in something. And there's no handhelding on the way to help you get in the experience barrier of getting a job and then getting on the job training and then being able to say that you have experience in that and continuing something as a career. Then that's something that really lets us down in discussions about education and business and employment. And I'm just wondering if anyone knows of any, even just working groups that are looking at that specific gap, rather than just saying that there is a gap, what are we doing about it? Okay, so let's, let's hold that question, we'll come back to that, that okay. that's a good one. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm a student at high school at the moment, and uh, I did a course in mechanical engineering last year as a part of year 11, and I have to disagree in that there really is a space, and I know in my school, uh, Wellington High School, that there really is a space for experimentation, and that my, my teacher was really fantastic in that, and that he'd show you how to use a lathe and said, here's a big bit of metal, have fun with it, and then he'd give you an arc welder <laughs> and give you a, a whole bunch of scrap metal and say, learn how to use it, you know, do what you want with it. And, and he really did give us that, that experimentation, and we learned better as a result of it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and Wellington High has really um, done amazing things, I think, over the years. Could um, I? Yes, well, he, he has an advantage. My father was a principal there for some time. Of course he was. <laughs> <laughs> It's all becoming clear. Um, and sorry, I didn't see you over there, so let's let's Could quickly I just, hear from um, you. Well. Want to go back to the future a little bit? Um, I am a product of uh, the government training system. Uh, I'm an electrical uh, fitter uh, by trade, and now systems manager. I was trained with the NZED. I um, spent a lot of my my training time on hydro power stations. Um, I was one of the I was one of the people that built our infrastructure. Okay. The infrastructure now that the government's attempting to sell, <laughs> the products that came out of, in, in, in regards to manpower that came out of those systems was uh, second to none, and it's been recognised recently um, in international reports. Um, and it wasn't just tradesmen, it was technicians, the whole gambit of, of employment uh, came out of those systems. Um, and so basically, I mean, a lot of those guys now have gone over to Australia um, to, uh, to apply their trade there. Um, and, and that was a vital link from school for a lot of us, you know, to move into those trades and have that training. A lot of those guys that came out of, that I uh, went there, now own um, quite good businesses uh, as electricians, et cetera, in there. So, you know, there's another vital link that's been severed that hopefully we can somehow return to. Um, that also gave, those, those um, schemes also gave great management skills, uh, they gave, I mean, I moved from Ōtaki, went up and down the country, met um, all sorts of different people from so, all so over the place. So this was an apprenticeship training program? Yes. Right. Yes. And, and let's thank you for that, and, and it relates back to the question we had earlier before, um, and, and also just to the, the tension between the idea that we go educate people and then throw them out into the industry and then they go into some job and away they go. They're perfect. They're great. It doesn't really work like that, right? What happens is that as an employer, you hire someone, then you have to retrain them or train them up to actually be useful. And the, the, the question is, you know, have we lost that apprenticeship thing and, and have com as companies, especially small ones, do we not want to, we don't want to take on anymore the, the four years, six years, 10 years, or if, you, if you're Jiro loves sushi, you know, 40 years or 30 years of apprenticeship required. So, um, Russ, I want to throw this to you, um, is sitting, sitting in, the, in the house, what, what can we do here to help companies um, take on people for longer periods of time and give them the training they need from a lower base to, to, to where they need to be? Uh, what, I might just start, I, I will address that in a second, I might just start with the broader question about when we're talking about the divide, I mean, th there are some basics that we just need to consider as well. Um, so aside from you know, access into the, the digital economy, people just need access to decent public schools. Um, there needs to be a welfare transfer system so that people have the basic income that they need to live on. Um, a tertiary incentive allowance so that single mums can get to university if that's what they want to do. Um, you know, 
there's a bunch of like just basic kind of fundamental social infrastructure um, that sits behind this whole discussion and I think we shouldn't ignore it because without all of that basic social infrastructure, none of the rest of it can happen. Ad addressing your specific question, I, I think the last speaker was very interesting for um, when we went through the last round of privatisation, we kind of didn't value um, a lot of the skills and education training that was happening within those state-owned enterprises. Um, and so when we abolished them, we lost a lot of that skills training without necessarily realising that's what we were doing. And so we were subsidising it, if you like, um, through those state-owned enterprises, and they lost a lot of money. Of course, the railways lost a lot of money, but of course, in the process, they were training a lot of people. Um, and so if we're going to re-recognise that, then it's a matter of making sure that we subsidise it, that we pay for those kind of apprenticeships, that we support employers to take on apprentices and we're willing to fund that and recognise that that's what we've done in the past and that's an essential part of the pathway from school into um, employment and into skills. So uh, we, the, the last government, I mean, for, to give them their credit, they did reintroduce the modern apprenticeship program and, and I think that did make a difference and I think that was a positive step, um, but we just need to do better with it. But it goes more than that, right? So, so Rod, you're a, you're a you know, lawyer. Law is a, an apprenticeship um, system, really, right? You come out of university and you've got to go through your, 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 your due, due diligence. Yep. Uh, I, 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 guess, uh, I guess that it, it is quite, a, as, a, as a small business owner, it is quite expensive to train people up. Um, mm -hmm. The MSI um, are doing some good things in that space. That we've very successfully used the internship program. Um, sadly, it only runs for, I think it's 12 weeks over the, over the summer. Um, it, it would be great to see more um, uh, 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 sort of to move on from uh, or to grow on a, an internship or a, um, apprenticeship uh, to move to kind of boot camp kind of um, mm. boot camp style um, apprenticeships where people are thrown in and particularly, I mean it's easy for us because we can get things out into the market very quickly as, I, as I've said repeatedly. Um, um, but you can't you, within a boot camp environment. You could do that. You could you could get great teams together, maybe in conjunction with universities or tertiary educators or even schools, um, to get whether it be a, a mobile technology or or a blog or um, just to get people doing things online in the real world. Mm -hmm. So, so I have one, one small success story. So there's a, a video game studio in Christchurch called Cerebral Fix. They employ between 70 to 80 people. And they're now a strategic partner with the um, Ministry of Social Development. So I think they now get... So they've effectively set themselves up as an, an academy and they take um, youth unemployment um, issue that um, Anthony was talking about before, who don't have, haven't been to university because you don't need that to make a game or an app. And I think they've taken 15 to 20 um, previously unemployed youths and just put them through their boot camp um, to make video games for an export market. So that's a strategic partnership with MSD and it's happening. And then also, at the same time, I know they also take advantage of the, the MSI internship program, which is excellent. Uh, just jumping onto that, since I see all the tweets at the moment about hacking, I'm not much of a Zuckerberg fan, but if you read the, um, uh, the IPO statement for Facebook, then he talked about the hack away as a philosophy, and it was actually something I liked about the documentation, we find that often the people coming out of institutions aren't really comfortable with the hat away because it's not the way they've been taught. Um, and I remember a guy I hired not so long ago, he built three, web three websites himself, one about transformers, one about animals eating animals, and I can't remember the other one, <laughs> but him doing that and being able to fix it on the run in front of people while they're watching actually got him the job. So I think with all this talk about education, which is fabulous, absolutely necessary, um, but um, I think there's a lot to be said for the hat away. Okay, so we have uh, six minutes left, is that right? Yep. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to hear from these two gentlemen over here and yourself over there. Um, please keep it uh, 30 to 60 seconds. Um, and then I'm going to ask the panel... Um, that what's your, in a, in a minute or less than a minute, because that, that's going to go over time, what's your vision of a, of a future internet empowered New Zealand? Uh, and then how do we get there? I know that's a big question and needs an hour to answer, but just give us your bullet point. What's your vision? How do we get there? And remembering that uh, succinctness is, uh, is always uh, more powerful as, uh, as Russell has, uh, has shown us today. So um, over to you. I'm going to make a pitch that everyone here tries to encourage the local schools to encourage kids to do everything with computers, and that in includes, and I have to use this word formally, computer science. We want uh, computing elevated out of technology into computer science. I know that, firm, that phrase doesn't go down too well, 
And what we mean by that is let the kids learn Scratch or Alice, so they're actually learning the fundamentals of language. And if they are get, getting supervision, they then understand the underlying principles. And I know from 50 years of experience managing programmers, you can take a programmer that's competent at that level and teach them a new language in less than three weeks. So please make that uh, plea. And the, uh, the old NZICT, the new IITP, has a program of getting um, IT professionals into schools and in front of classrooms. So I encourage you to have a look at that and, and sign up. I spent the whole day yesterday in uh, front of the uh, parliamentary inquiry into 21st century education across the way. And, and the discussion there, I think, really reflects the experience we all had listening to Emma Smythe, that technology can now reach beyond the classroom. And, that, and the discussion across the street was about a classroom without walls. And I'm thinking that there's opportunities here in New Zealand for employers to produce learning materials for uh, not just apprentices, but people who would like to come work for your company, you can tell them about you know, what they need to know before they come to work for you. And what the internet allows us to do is to have instant access to persistently available information. And what I'm really key on is open education resources, and if the panel could comment on the availability of those in New Zealand. Oh, we don't have, unfortunately, don't have time to, to, to comment. Um, um, over to you. Yep. Um, I'll just go. I think one of the challenges in this discussion is that everyone has a mental model of what an education is because they've all had one. What we need going forward into the future isn't just an education because we can all measure education and governments can put money into education and we can say we can have these uh, blocks that we call education. What we need is young people who are learners because whenever I, and I've retrained twice in my, in my life to, to, to do other things. Whenever you go into something new, you have to learn. Everyone in this room is a learner. You've learned something today. And we need to be thinking about what do we value in our learners. Um, our education system values things that we can measure. We call those standards. We call those degrees. We call those um, qualifications. But what our society needs is people who are learning, seeing problems, choosing tools, having discussions, making connections, and going forward so that the society, in all these ways, business, education, farming, environment, we, we, that's how we solve those problems. 100%. Okay, so now let's turn to the panel, and we're going to start at the far side with Anthony, and uh, the question is, uh, what's your vision, uh, and how do we get there? You have a minute starting from now. Um, what I see is uh, Aotearoa uh, being connected, that those in the cities and those in the rural areas have exactly the same opportunities. I see uh, a an internet-connected society that not only provides economic, economic opportunities in the rural areas, um, but it also provides the ability for us to strengthen our cultures, uh, provides the ability for us to strengthen our communities, and provides the ability uh, for all of us to participate in a global world. It doesn't mean that we are global, but it actually celebrates our uh, diverseness and it celebrates the way in which we all want to be different. The funny thing is, the more that we globalise we become, the more we actually want to differentiate ourselves from the rest of the world. And the internet has that ability for us to be able to celebrate that. We need to think, uh, to get there, we need to have a single unity of purpose to arrive there. It is, we can debate many things, but I think we're all, um, we all want this, the, um, the same thing at the end of the day. I'm really impressed with countries like Taiwan and China and, and Korea and places like that who have a single unity of purpose. They understand where they sit in the world and where they need to get to. I think New Zealand needs to have exactly the same kind of single vision of purpose. And I really miss the fact that Sir Paul Callaghan is not with us any longer. Kia ora. Kia ora. So, uh, so do I, so do I. Um, um, Russell. Yeah, I don't know if I've got much to add. Um, <laughs> I, I, I guess um, critical thinking uh, and learning, um, to kind of reflect the last speaker over there, um, seems to me central to it, and valuing those things seems to me critical if we're going to be successful. Obviously, as I spoke about earlier, I think protecting freedom and, and the space to uh, for to people to innovate and to think and discuss is going to be central to it. Um, 
and then getting the right kind of infrastructure that sits behind that, whether it's broadband, whether it's education. Um, all of those things together, I think, give us a great opportunity, actually, and, um, and having a government that values it and puts it central uh, to its economic strategy uh, so that actually investing in things beyond um, just commodities is seen as central to the strategy of the government, I think, is um, an absolutely crucial ingredient in making all of those things come together. Thank you. Um, I, I think uh, there, there are some, some, some serious uh, considerations for the future, uh, particularly around privacy and, um, and security, but the reality is that the future is here now, uh, and we need less talk and more rock. Um, and uh, so uh, start doing things, get into the mobile market, get into uh, the, the gaming market, the, uh, the entry for um, the, the the entry barriers are not there anymore, um, and uh, uh, the the tyranny of distance is gone, and those and in fact is, a, is now an advantage to us. So, um, so s let's let's do it. Okay, William. <coughs> My vision is that uh, agriculture in the future still underpins the economy. And, and I say that um, not because I think we should be tripling the number of cows, um, but I think there's enormous opportunity to add value to what we already produce. And in order to do that, we need information. Agriculture has become very information dense. And so information will add, add value to our products. Um, it will help us increase our productivity without um, going across our environmental, increasing our environmental footprint. Um, and it will help us move up the value chain and closer to our markets. And how do we get there? There's only uh, th there's one fundamental thing that we need to do, and that is to make sure that out in the rural sector we have good broadband because that is the bottleneck. Yep. Fran. Um, I wouldn't uh, disagree with it. In fact, I fully support um, what the other speakers have said. Um, I think one of the pleas I do have is that um, that people don't write off old media too quickly, that, um, that when the time comes there is a recognition that people are producing work, are producing goods, and that um, that, that at some stage has to be paid for. Um, I think, you know, democratically, uh, New Zealand's going to be at quite a loss if um, that debate isn't held. And I know this is um, seen as um, heresy, but... Um, it's, it's, it's a debate that has to be had, and I think it's something that's um, good for the country that we do have it. Um, in terms of um, just the general economic um, situation, I think the government needs to do a stop take. I think there needs to be a recognition that um, while agriculture is the base of the economy, it's not the entire economy, and that if we want to have a robust and interesting economy, uh, we need to use internet-enabled um, platforms and technologies to provide jobs to keep our people here, because I am seriously concerned at the huge diaspora and also the loss of talented young people who are not being provided uh, with jobs here under the current situation. And so my vision is that we're all sitting at the beach on our laptops um, doing what Sir, Sir Paul Callaghan said, you know, ex, you know, doing the weird little things to global niche audiences. But, for instance, when Fonterra launched the global dairy trade online auction platform, a whole bunch of farmers said, that's a really weird, stupid thing. Why are you doing it? You know, and that's an example of how you can apply this stuff mm. to the old um, industry as well. How we need to get there, what, we had Stephen Joyce, we had David Shear, we've had other politicians say, the, say things, niceties. What's missing in their tone of voice is the damn urgency. This stuff is here. It may not be mm. evenly distributed, but by golly, it is here now. It's going to happen fast, and I just don't see the politicians talking about it with any urgency and talking it to people outside this room with any urgency. One thing that's been missing today is for all this to happen, we need a trusted web. There's a real opportunity for us to fall way behind if people don't trust the web. So I'd say a trusted web has to be part of it. And within that, people capitalising on the ability to lead a digital life. And they're going to do that through a lot of the stuff that made people like John Britton, Paul Callaghan, Bill Hamilton great, innovation, roll up your sleeves. Um, harnessing the close community, which will help us with trust. And what I think is a, is a meritocracy. Um, and in terms of what will make that vision come true, David talked about, David Harvey talked about disruption. 
understanding the disruption, really understanding it, and then how to engage and demystify that to get on with it, and then infrastructure, commercialisation and hustle. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. Um, thank you to, um, uh, to, the, to the audience who participated as well. Um, I apparently have an obsession with cows, um, if, if this is true. Um, I have an obsession with the, the wider um, uh, uh, economy that's underpinned by agriculture, I think, like Fran. Uh, the, uh, I think the, the, the urgency message really, really struck a chord with us. Let's just get out there and get doing it. Let's... Let's take people on who have got the attitude, but perhaps not the experience or the education. Let's take them on and bring them through and train them up. Um, and uh, and let's, uh, let's reach out to schools and get down there and help the schools uh, pr produce better people, maybe even by fronting up there and, and getting in front of classrooms yourselves. So thank you, everyone, for, uh, for a great panel. Um, thank you, Lance. Thank you, panellists. That was far and away the very, very, very best panel discussion that we've had so far this morning. Uh, well done. Okay.